Well, good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day outside and in. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I'm Ramona Lynn Bethley, lead pastor here, and it is just a great day to worship our Lord together. Now, if you haven't done so already, I want to invite you to please sign in on the registration pads. You'll find them to the inside of each aisle. And if someone slips in, I hope you will, and they sit near you, I hope you will help them register their attendance as well. So a teenage boy, 18, 19 years old, uh, had finally had enough. He said to his parents he was, he was leaving. He was leaving home. There was nothing they could do or say to stop him. He was ready for adventure and excitement. He wanted fame, fortune, and fun, and he knew that he was not going to find it in the one-horse town that they were living in. And so he grabs his things, and he is walking to the door, and, and he says, you can't stop me, you just can't stop me. And about that time, his dad steps into his path, and he says, no, dad, you cannot stop me. There's nothing you can do or say to stop me. And his dad said, stop you? Son, I'm going with you. <laughs> Isn't it funny how the things we don't have are the things we think we want? They look so attractive on the outside, but the question we have to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Is it really worth it to attain those things? Well, today is the first Sunday of Lent, and we're starting a new sermon series called Boot Camp, Fit for Life. And I want to invite you into a journey, into our own six-week boot camp where we will examine ourselves and our relationship with God. And as we get started this week, we're going to look at probably the number one thing that often stands in our way and stands between us and our relationship with God, and that is temptation. So as we begin this time of worship, let us pray. Lord, we are so tempted by everything we see the glitz and the glitter of the world and the get-rich-quick schemes that are placed before us. We believe that if we just had enough money, just enough friends, just enough power, just enough stuff, it'll all be okay. Oh, Lord, show us how foolish we are to place our hope and our trust in these things. And give us hearts for loving others. Help us to find the strength and the courage and the security of home. Lord, we know it is time for a change. Give us the courage to make it. Amen. I want to invite you now to stand as we join together in our call to worship. Today, the journey begins. Are you ready? Yes, it is time to make a change. It is time to let go of the chains of despair. Are you ready? Yes, it is time for a change. It is time to wander out of the wilderness and into the unconditional love of God. Are you ready? Yes, it is time for a change. It is time to feel the freedom that only forgiveness brings. Are you ready? Yes, it is time for a change. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is found in your hymnals number 269, Lord, throughout these 40 days.
now as one body, let us affirm our faith. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. children and Emily to come forward for our children's time. Jack, are you going to children's church later? Because I want to make sure we all wish you happy birthday. Because you had a birthday this week, right? You, you turned, was it last week? Oh, okay. Well, happy birthday, because I don't think we wished him happy birthday yet. Double digits, right? <laughs> 10. All right. Well, 11. Oh, so double ones. Well, happy birthday. Now that I've completely embarrassed you, you're welcome. <laughs> well, I have an embarrassing story about myself, if that makes you feel better. Um, so when I was little, my mom, it was my birthday almost, and my mom had this really great brown Volvo station wagon. We loved it. Anyway, um, she told me she had my big, it was a birthday present in the back of the car, and she had put a blanket over it. And she said, whatever you do, do not look under that blanket, Emily. And y'all, I just had to. Oh, God. And so I did. And it was a slip and slide. And I had been wanting a slip and slide for a really long time, Okay. Who's your mom? I shouldn't have told her. Oh, my God. Okay. So, I, well, I don't know if you know this about me, but my face, it, like, doesn't lie, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, anyway, that's a side story. I, I told her. She found out. I can't remember if I told her or what. And so, she returned the slip and slide, y'all. Like, I didn't, I didn't get the slip and slide. But you know what I got instead? A, a mini trampoline. <laughs> <laughs> which I really loved, so poor Nana um, didn't really teach me much of a lesson there, right? But um, I feel like the moral of this story is uh, you, there's always a better plan, right, <laughs> that you should go with instead of uh, going with temptation. God, God knows that there's a better plan for you. Um, the, but today we're talking about temptation and I bet there's been a time when your mom or dad or somebody told you not to do something. Whatever you're doing, don't press that red button that, presses, that says press me, right? Yeah. And you really want to do it, though. No? Yeah. yeah. And James's favorite thing when he gets in trouble is to say, but I just wanted to. Right? Like when he's like, I'm going to open the car door while I'm driving. Like, but I just wanted to. What? Okay, so that's how temptation feels, though. It's like you know something's a bad idea, but you just want to, right? And to me, one of the most important parts of the story today is that Jesus felt that. Did you know that? He, just like we feel that, like we feel like, oh, we want to do that, but we know it's not good. Jesus went through the same feeling when he was a human. Isn't that crazy? Like, he, he did that for us. He came to the earth. He went through all of these same human experiences that we go through. 
And one of the worst ones is temptation, right? And he went through that. And he said, when he was tempted, he said, no, I'm not going to press the red button that says press me. I'm going to do what God wants me to. And he kept his eye and mind in the right place, okay? And it's hard to do. It's so hard. But the, the good news is God knows your whole plan. And he knew that I was going to look at the slip and slide. Um, and he knew Nana was going to buy me a trampoline. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, that's okay. So let's say a quick prayer before Thomas gets totally off about trampoline. Dear God, Thank you for coming to earth and going through all of the same things we do. Going through all the same things we do. Give us strength to resist temptation and follow you. Follow you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Thanks, kids. So something that a lot of you know about me is that I grew up Catholic. Uh, Lent was always a time where I gave up sweets or tried to give up TV, tried to give up something that I liked. Um, and it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I discovered adding things during Lent was really where I got the most out of it. And now I try to get rid of things that um, more affect my happiness, things that have, are crushing my joy. And this year, I'm trying to give up worry, which if you ask me how it's going, we're three days in and I'm pretty worried about it. Um, trying to trust God requires a lot of silence. You know, it's very easy for me to try to sing my way into redemption, but God talks to me the most when I'm quiet when I'm not singing. So maybe it's just a coincidence that I lost my voice during these first three days of land. You know, God is trying to make me listen. Um, in the opening words to this song, come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. And it is a very noisy world we're in. And, you know, the only way that God can speak to us is when we're quiet. The only way for hope to reenter your heart is when you're quiet, when you're in prayer. So our prayer right now as we enter these 40 days of Lent is that we are guided by God. May God guide us to um, loosen whatever needs to be loosened and uh, upgrade whatever we need to work on, increase our prayer, and increase our love for God. Let us pray. God, we love you, and that's why we're here. And so we ask that you pull us in, Lord. Draw us in. Help us to close our eyes and hear your word for us. Scripture talks about the fragrance of Christ and I think what that is, is love, pure love. And so we ask that you fill each of us with that love for God, love of neighbor, and love for you, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray and sing this morning. Amen.
Thank you, choir. As we come to our time of prayer, I want us to lift up uh, Beverly Townley. Uh, she had a pacemaker this week, and she is home from the hospital, and I got to talk to her, I guess, the day after they did the pacemaker, and she sounded great, was doing great. She was still in the hospital, but ready to go home, and uh, so everything went very well with that. And just in this season of Lent, the scripture reminded me to, to pray for those who are alone, who are lonely, who are in, the scripture this morning is about Jesus in the wilderness, and so those who are just struggling in their own wilderness, whatever that might look like. So let us pray. Most wonderful and loving God, our hearts are full of joy as we gather in your house to worship you this morning. As we greet old friends and welcome new ones, we delight also in your presence with us. As we gather in your name, may the heavens be opened for us that we may catch a glimpse of the light and the love that transforms our common days into holy days, so that we may see with new eyes the beauty of creation, not of our making. As we celebrate today the first Sunday of Lent, a season of repentance, a time of self-examination, a period of personal silence and waiting. As we take this journey that draws us ever closer to you by your Spirit, walk with us, Lord. Sustain us and feed us and nurture us. As we wander into the wilderness of our lives, help us. Help us to confront and conquer the temptations that assail and assault us. Give us the strength through the power of your Holy Spirit that we may experience a new life of faith, abounding in hope and teeming with unconditional love and forgiveness. As we are led by your Spirit into this season of repentance, may we discover the goodness and fullness of a life in your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And may we also use this time, this season of Lent, to empty ourselves of all that makes us deaf to your world. Fill us with your grace that we might hear the cries of injustice, the desperations of the needy, the anger of the wronged, the despair of the hopeless, and the worries of the afflicted. Guide us with your hand that we might be instruments of your love and healing in our hungry and hurting world. This we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we enter into this first Sunday of Lent, this season of preparation for the next 40 days, what better way to begin than with the 40 days that Jesus prepared for his ministry? 
So we look at Matthew's story of Jesus in the wilderness, Matthew 4, the first 11 verses, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you really are the Son of God, tell these stones to be turned into bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but feed on the word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will, commend, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to a test. And again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this will be given to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him let us pray almighty god still the busyness of our minds and open our hearts to you that we may hear your word for us this day amen well, two identical brothers, Hadley and Bradley, joined the army together, and they were delighted when they were uh, sent off to boot camp at the same time to the same place. Now, because they were identical twins, they were put in different balloon, uh, balloons. <laughs> they were put in different platoons and different barracks so that the drill sergeants could tell them apart. But even though they were separated, they still spent their free time together. And so one evening, Hadley was sitting on Bradley's bunk, and Bradley was who knows where. And uh, all of a sudden, the drill sergeant comes into those barracks and, uh, and is mad. Mad as all get out. Well, uh, not wanting to get his brother in trouble, Hadley stands at attention at the end of the bunk and, you know, takes whatever venom the drill sergeant was spitting out at them, and, and he was so disappointed in their performance that day out in the field and, and was punishing them and was going to send them out through the night to march uh, in the rain with a 100-pound rucksack on their back. Well, Hadley took... Bradley's punishment and in fact it took about 10 hours it was about lunch the next day for the two of them could safely swap places and identities and and it was interesting that they were that uh, Hadley as he was marching was told by the drill sergeant you're going to stay out there gentlemen until you uh, and, while, and while you're out there think about Think about what it means to be a soldier. Think about what it means to serve this country and why you are here. Well, boot camps come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Not only does the military use it to train our men and women for service and battle, you know, we can actually pay good money 
to a boot camp for physical fitness. That, that, that instructors will get us up at 5.30 in the morning and, and work out with us. In fact, I was talking to Clark this morning. He went out for a run this morning, seven miles. Good for you, Clark. And we were talking about marathons. And if he ever wanted to run a marathon, and he said, well, those cost a lot of money. And I said, you mean you have to be paid? You have to pay to be tortured like that? You know, well, you can pay people to torture you uh, at boot camps for physical fitness as well. There's also companies that will use boot camps to train new employees. When I became your district superintendent, uh, I was sent off to a, a boot camp to learn how to do that work. We called it charm school. Am I charming? <laughs> But yeah, companies will use boot camps. Even uh, there are marriage boot camps. Couples can go off and work on their relationships. There's all kinds of boot camps. And each one of these boot camps, well, they're an intense workout in some way uh, of our mind, our body, of our spirit. It's a time of personal introspection and investigation. Boot camps help us buy in or tap out. They're intended to push us beyond what we think our bodies can bear, what we think we can do. They test our limits and strengthen our resolve. Which is how I want us to think about this season of Lent. I want to invite us to enter into a kind of boot camp, a time of introspection and investigation, a period of intense work on our soul, hard work, a time of seeking change of heart and action. Over these next six weeks, we're going to examine Scripture and walk a full range of the human experience from creation and transformation from life and death to new life in Christ. Think of it as a boot camp for the soul, a time of testing and training and strengthening of our faith. And what better way to begin this work, this boot camp for our soul, than looking at Jesus' boot camp, his training for ministry. So let's take a look. In this scripture that I read just before it, if you go back a chapter, you will see that Jesus was baptized. And right after his baptism, after he comes up out of the water, he is led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. There for 40 days and 40 nights, he is fasting and praying, probably meditating on Scripture, readying himself for the ministry that lays ahead of him. And after these 40 days, the devil comes to him and, and tempts him, not just once, not twice, but Three times the devil tempts Jesus. So let's look at these temptations. So the first temptation is not just a food temptation. Did you hear it? Did you, did you see it? The devil says to Jesus, if you really are the son of God, he does that actually in the first two temptations, if you're really the son of God. So it's like the devil is planting this little seed of doubt, trying to just, you know, poke at Jesus the best way possible. If you really are the son of God, then you turn these stones into bread. Now, at first glance, we think, really, Jesus being tempted? There's, there's no way, no way. He's the Son of God after all. This, this is going to be no big deal. But it is a big deal. It's a really big deal because you remember that Jesus is human also. So this temptation becomes a real thing even to Jesus. Jesus is hungry. He had not eaten in, in 40 days, so he's probably starving to death. He has a real physical and immediate need to eat. 
How many times have we been tempted in the same way to satisfy an immediate need, a hunger that we have? Pay, buy now, pay later. Or a physical hunger or yearning that we're feeling that threatens our moral fiber. But Jesus knew that he could... He could not rely on his strength alone to fight off this temptation. So what does he do? He relies on scripture. He, he says back to Satan, Deuteronomy 8, 3, man does not live by bread alone, but feeds on the word of God that comes from the mouth of God. Feeds on the word that comes from the mouth of God. Boom. Drop the mic. Take that, Satan. Jesus is not going to forsake his mission for a muffin, and we shouldn't either. So the next temptation, well, it's a grasp at popularity. Satan takes Jesus to the top of the temple in front of God and everybody. There were lots of people milling around. And he says uh, to Jesus, show off your power. Show off the power of God. Show them what God can do for you and them. Prove to yourself, because he says again, if you really are the Son of God, prove to yourself and all these other people out here how great your God is. And he won't let anything harm you. Well, this could have been a real temptation to Jesus as well. He had been alone, perhaps even lonely. Forty days out there in the wilderness. You know, I've been known to make some pretty bad choices when I'm alone. We all do. When we're lonely, when we think no one is looking, we can make bad choices, succumb to temptation. And it's not just being lonely or alone. There is this offer of instant popularity, instant success that Satan had laid before Jesus. Popularity and success can be intoxicating for us. Satan wanted Jesus to believe that A miracle like this, well, would certainly shock all those people into instant belief. It would propel him into the limelight, into fame and fortune. But Jesus wasn't looking for that. He didn't want instant popularity. Jesus was playing the long game. He had a longer game in mind, and thank goodness... Thank goodness for us. Thank goodness for our own salvation that he did. Because why bring just a few people into faith if he had tested God in that way? Instead, now for over 2,000 years, millions upon millions of people have followed, are following, and will follow Jesus. That's the big miracle. That's the big story that's here. And finally, the third temptation, this grab for power. Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, lays it out like a big buffet before him. Jesus would have had great political power in that moment king of the castle, big man on campus, power and control right at his fingertips. Jesus would be the hero of all people if he had taken the prize. The people were already being burdened, oppressed by the government, and here Jesus had his chance to make it all right for them. Jesus could give them the freedom that they had been looking for, seeking, begging, asking for. After all, isn't that what he was trying to do in the first place? 
free people from their oppression, not a bad thing, right? The problem was this plan, this plan was not God's plan. This plan was Satan's plan, and Jesus wasn't buying it. I had a young man in my office one night in tears. He had been offered a promotion, and he took it. It was offering him more money, but it meant more responsibility, more travel, more temptation. What looked like a great opportunity for his family had become a crisis. Everything he thought he wanted to provide for his family, which is not a bad thing, was now tearing his family apart. He had gone from hero to zero. And for what? New car, bigger house, fancier lifestyle? And he knew that he just couldn't sustain it. It was time for a change. You know, at the end of the day, temptation is temptation. Temptation is that sin that separates us from God. It breaks God's heart. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Temptations are those personal choices that we succumb to. That, that shortcut to life. Because we want this quick and easy fix to be different, to have things to be different than they are, for us to feel different about ourselves, to, to, to appear as if we have it all together than when in reality things are just unraveling around us. At the end, when we succumb to temptation, we think things are going to be better, but I promise you, they just get worse. So what do we do? What do we do about it when we are tempted? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Here, let me tell you. We can do exactly what Jesus did. Because did you hear it? Did you feel it? Did you see it? You know, Jesus didn't perform any miracles when he was tempted. He didn't use any of, the, any of his Son of God powers. He used exactly the same resources that we have available to us when it comes to combating temptation. Jesus has what we have. Jesus used prayer. He, he was all prayed up. He used scripture that he either meditated on and obviously memorized because right off his lips to combat temptation each and every time, Jesus gave Satan scripture Jesus tapped into the power of God. He had that. We have that available to us as well. And here's the other great thing that I love about this story. Did you see how Jesus was powered up before the crisis? That he used that time in the wilderness for prayer and meditation. So Jesus was prayed up and shored up before he was ever tempted. Beforehand, he had scripture memorized and on his lips. We could do that too, you know. Then when Jesus was faced with temptation, he had all the arsenal he needed. He had everything in his toolbox just right there. He had the strength of God enter into him in the midst of the crisis, in the middle of the temptation. We have the same opportunity. You know, when God enters into, uh, into us, we can feel it. We feel a deeper sense of trust, a, a confidence in God and in ourselves, a, an inner peace that is within us to walk away. We won't just think we can do the right thing. We know we can do the right thing when we are prayed up and shored up and we allow the power of God to enter into us. We will know exactly what to do, exactly what to say, how to answer, when to walk away. I want to challenge us during this six weeks, our boot camp, to get prayed up, to get shored up, 
in prayer, meditation, scripture, so that when trouble comes, because it will, we are ready. We are ready to do battle. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, enter into us with trust, with confidence, with the assurance that we know that whatever it is that we might face, we can handle it because you are with us. Because, Lord, we don't want anything, anything to separate us from you. We don't want to turn our backs on you. And when we do, Lord, forgive us. Turn us around. Amen. Well, during this uh, Lenten season, there are great ways to get connected into the life of the church. Uh, there's an insert in your bulletin, a calendar on the back. Uh, we're doing a Lenten mission. We're going to fill some we used to call them flood buckets. Now we're calling them cleaning kits. And this list that's on here, those are all the items that go into one bucket, which is why it's kind of listed that way. We're going to work on filling 50 buckets. So uh, there's a bin back there in the back that is you're at the grocery store. Uh, these are size specific. The Say that three times. Uh, and uh, so we need these particular sizes because they all have to fit in the five-gallon bucket and the lid has to go on it. So, um, uh, yeah, so take this to the grocery store with you and help us do a great mission. Then we're going to have some fun later down the road after Easter and fill those buckets and then deliver them to UMCOR, but there'll be more information about that as well. New Bible study starts on Wednesday, a time to grow. That's in here as well. Wednesday's at 6 o'clock. And then, gentlemen, uh, coffee and conversation is this Thursday, 9 o'clock at Bricotta's, so you're going to have a, a good breakfast, some good coffee, and some good company. Uh, so that's this Thursday, March 2nd, uh, at Bricotta's out on Highway 28. Other great stuff happening in the life of the church, you'll see that in, uh, in your insert. So... Uh, yes, come and get connected. The best way to get connected, though, is to decide that you're going to make this church your church. And if you're ready to do that, we'd love to celebrate that decision with you. I invite you to come forward at the end of our, while we sing the closing song. But if it makes you nervous, then just see me after the worship service. Elizabeth? Our closing song today can be found in your black, The Faith We Sing books, number 2214, Lead Me, Guide Me. That's number 2214. Let's stand and sing together.
just me or did y'all have words we didn't have? Really? <laughs> Good job. <laughs> but it was a great song. Thank you. All right. So thank you for being here, for choosing to worship here today. I want to send you out with this word. Have courage. Take heart. Let the Lord lead you and make good choices where you work, where you play, and where you live. And may the peace of God be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.